In this online lecture, we're going to discuss one of the four important aspects of HNMR. And that aspect is number one here, the number of peaks in the NMR spectrum equal the number or type of hydrogens or other atoms in the molecule. We not only have to know this truth for organic chemistry, but we have to know how to apply this principle. So let me show you what I mean by that. This is a definitely must-have skill. Here's sample problem one. It says, how many signals would there be in the NMR spectrum of the following molecules? So basically, the ability to look at a molecule and make a prediction of how many peaks we might find in the data of the NMR. And for this section here, we're specifically focusing on HNMR, which means we want to know how many signals there would be for a molecule due to the different types of H atoms it contains. So for instance, let's look at this molecule right here. How many signals in the HNMR would we see for this molecule? Well, the way it works here is very simple. Just start anywhere. For instance, all these hydrogens here on the left, A-type hydrogens. They're definitely in some particular electronic environment. Then move on to the next hydrogen here. These hydrogens right here, let's call them B, would definitely be in a different environment than the methyl hydrogens. However, these last hydrogens here on the right, notice this molecule has a plane of symmetry right here, which means these hydrogens would be in an identical environment than the A-type hydrogens, so we simply call them A hydrogens as well which means we should expect to see two signals in the HNMR for this molecule. There it is. That's the skill. Sometimes these questions alone are on an organic chemistry test. Other times, this skill is just part of a bigger problem. Let's look at another example here. What about this molecule right here? Notice we saw in the previous molecule that symmetry plays an important role here. So let's notice right here that we do have a symmetrical line in this molecule right here, which means if I call these hydrogens A-type hydrogens, then these would be also A-type hydrogens because they're across that symmetrical line. We'd move our way to the next hydrogens here. This would be a B-type hydrogen. He's right on the line of symmetry. And right next to him, these would be C-type hydrogens. They're clearly different from A and B. And the last hydrogens here, they would not be A hydrogens, they would actually be D hydrogens. Remember, they're different from A because they rest upon the line of symmetry, whereas the A hydrogens are across the line of symmetry. So we should expect to see four signals in the HNMR for this molecule. Notice this is a very unique skill. What other subject requires you to do things like this? So this may seem a little awkward at first, but with enough practice, you'll start to get it. So let's look at another sample problem here. How many signals in the HNMR for this guy? Well, we'll start here and call these the A-type hydrogens. But what I want to teach you through this example is that these would actually be A-type hydrogens, and so would these. In other words, all of these methyls are equivalent. I'll explain why in a second, but let's keep going here. If those are the A-type hydrogens, then this right here would be the B-type hydrogens. And these guys right here would be C-type hydrogens, and we can expect to see three signals in his HNMR. Notice here, the A-type hydrogens are all equivalent, but not necessarily because of symmetry. For instance, let's get a closer look at our molecule here. Let's represent each methyl as some kind of colored sphere here, like this. And then let's place a line right here, like this. Now, focus on the carbon that has those three methyls, the blue, green, and red. To the right of him, he's connected to a CH2 carbon. That bond between them, remember, is a sigma bond, which means that bond can rotate, which means as this molecule sits in the NMR machine, that bond will rotate, which means these methyls will spin around like this consistently. What that means is each one of these methyls are averagely in the same environment. In fact, the term for this is called signal averaging. If we were to freeze this molecule, then we should expect to see separate peaks for each one of these methyls. But remember, we know the reality. This molecule is spinning that bond, so these methyls average out as roughly being in the same environment, which means they would give the same signal on the HNMR. So, 
That's what we would expect to see here, and that's what we're learning. You now know how to handle situations like this. But let's look at another example here. What do we do in this case? Well, notice you have a line of symmetry right here, which means if I start here and call this the A-type hydrogen, then this would also have to be an A-type hydrogen. But notice this molecule has more than one symmetrical line here. He's also symmetrical this way, which means this hydrogen in the lower left would be the same as the A hydrogen in the upper left. And the last hydrogen here would also be an A-type hydrogen because of the one above him. So we would expect to only see one signal in the HNMR for this molecule. Let's look at another example here. How many signals in the HNMR for this guy? Again, let's start somewhere. Let's start with this methyl and say these would be A-type hydrogens. Clearly, those hydrogens are different from this hydrogen right here. He would be a B-type hydrogen. And what we're going to learn here is that this hydrogen in the upper right-hand corner would actually be a C-type hydrogen, and the last hydrogen here would be actually a D-type hydrogen. We would get four signals here. All of these hydrogens are different. But let's understand why here. Remember, double bonds, we learned in a previous online lecture that double bonds cannot be rotated. That means that this hydrogen is fixed up here like this, which makes him this distance away from the methyl. And again, because the bond can't rotate, that means this D hydrogen is fixed in space as well. Notice he would be technically further away from this methyl. That means that he is in technically a different electronic environment than C is. We need to know that the NMR machine is that sensitive. It would perceive the D hydrogens to be in a different electronic environment as the C hydrogens. And lastly here, the B hydrogen right here would be this distance away from the methyl. Again, that's a distance that's different from the D and the C type hydrogens. So that's why he would have his own corresponding signal on the HNMR. Let's look at another example here. What do we do with benzene rings? How many signals for this guy? Well, the first thing you should do is obviously is fill in the hydrogens that would be present. And what I want to prove to you here is that benzene rings can be treated as symmetrical objects, which means technically there's a line of symmetry right here. Now, some of you might be wondering, how could that be? Because on this side, we have a double bond, and on the other side of the symmetry line, we have a single bond. Well, it's actually all about resonance here. Let's go back and look at this structure. Remember, the resonant structure here is that these pi electrons can move this way, these will move in turn this way, and then these will move this way. What that ends up giving us is this resonance result, which remember, this bond right here is partially double bond, and he's partially single bond. And remember, this is true for all of the bonds in the benzene ring, which means sometimes benzene rings are represented this way. This reminds us that all the bonds are the same in benzene, which means it's much clearer to see the plane of symmetry when written this way. So for us in organic chemistry, we're going to know benzene rings are always symmetrical, which means there is definitely a line of symmetry right here. And let's call out our hydrogens. Let's start with the methyl. We'll call these the A-type hydrogens. And because of our line of symmetry, these would be the B-type hydrogens. These would therefore be the C-type hydrogens. Notice they're further away from the methyl. And this would be the D-type hydrogen. He is the furthest away from the methyl. So we would expect to see four signals in the HNMR. Now let's look at another harder example here. Look what this one says. It says, how would you use HNMR spectroscopy to distinguish cis-1,2-dimethylcyclopropane, trans-1,2-dimethylcyclopropane, and 1,1-dimethylpropane. Let's get a better look at this. Here's one of the molecules. This is the cis version. This right here would be the trans version of the molecule, and this would be the 1,1-dimethylpropane version of it. Think about why we would need to distinguish these. If we ran each one of these molecules in the mass spec, the mass spec would report the same data for all three. They all have the same molecular weight and the same molecular formula. We can also say that if we threw these molecules in the IR machine, the IR machine would spit out the same data for all three. So it's really only the NMR machine that's going to help us distinguish between these three. Or so we hope. Let's see if it does. 
Let's start with this molecule right here. Let's try to predict how many HNMR signals we would see for him. Well, the first thing we should do is get a better, more realistic view of that molecule. Here's one way to represent him. What I want you to see here is, is that you can treat almost the ring of this molecule as something like a table. And that is a table in a certain plane. And I need you to see that these items right here would be considered to be under the table. Which means these items right here would be above the table. The reason why we want to think of this molecule as having this geometry is that it helps us determine if hydrogens are in different environments. Remember, that's solely what the NMR machine is based on. So let me show you how, if you conceptualize the molecule this way, how it will help you. For instance, start right here, let's say, with this methyl and say these are the A-type hydrogens. But notice what we have here, technically, is a plane of symmetry that runs through the actual ring. That means these hydrogens right here would also be A-type hydrogens. Now, moving along here, we can call these B-type hydrogens. Remember, they're not methyl hydrogens, so that's why they're not A. And again, because of our plane of symmetry, if this is a B-type hydrogen, then underneath this would also have to be a B-type hydrogen. And what about this hydrogen right here? Well, notice there's actually a symmetrical line that runs this way through the molecule. Take a minute and see that. It's because of this symmetrical line that we would call this the B-type hydrogen. He is equivalent to those other B-type hydrogens. And because of our plane of symmetry, that means this would also be a B-type hydrogen underneath. So technically, there's only two types of hydrogens in this molecule, and therefore we should expect to see two signals in his HNMR. So let's go back to our problem here and log that here, this guy, two signals. And now let's focus on this guy. How many signals in the HNMR for him? Well, again, let's represent our molecule as the table again. And let's start somewhere and call this the A-type hydrogens. Notice in this molecule, you have a line of symmetry right here. So if those are the A-type hydrogens, then these would be also A-type hydrogens which makes this hydrogen right here a B-type hydrogen, and this would be his equivalent B hydrogen. However, what about these hydrogens right here? Well, this would actually be a C-type hydrogen. Think about his environment for a second here. He's a hydrogen connected to a carbon that happens to have another hydrogen. Notice that's different from this B hydrogen right here. He's connected to a carbon that actually has a methyl connected. So that's why the C hydrogen is different from the B hydrogen. But what about the hydrogen underneath here? He would actually be a D-type hydrogen. Now, why is that? Well, look at the C-type hydrogen. When he looks across the table, he sees two methyls. When the D hydrogen underneath looks across the table, he sees two hydrogens instead. That technically means that they're in different electronic environments. So that means we would expect to see four signals in the HNMR for this molecule. So let's go back to our problem here and log that. This guy would have four signals. And let's look at the last remaining molecule right here. Let's look at his table representation. And let's start somewhere here and call this the A-type hydrogens. And what I want you to see here is notice these would also be A-type hydrogens which seems kind of tricky at first, but remember, since it's all about environment, let's go to the upper left A hydrogens right here and notice when they look across the table, they'll see this hydrogen right here, and on the other side, they'll see this hydrogen right here. Notice that's exactly what the A hydrogens underneath see as well. Again, when they look across the table underneath, they see one hydrogen here, and they see another hydrogen here. That puts them in identical electronic environments. And not only that, the A hydrogens on the upper left are connected to a carbon that has this hydrogen here. And that's also true for the A hydrogen in the lower right. So that takes care of the A type hydrogens. If we keep going here, then this would be a B type hydrogen. And at this point, we would want to ask ourselves, are there other hydrogens that are just like him? 
Well, if you notice, this hydrogen right here would be in the same environment, so he's also a B-type hydrogen. How is that so? Well, remember, this B hydrogen right here, when he looks across his bond, he sees a methyl. The other B hydrogen sees that as well. And when the B hydrogen on the left looks around the table here, he sees a hydrogen over here to the left and a methyl to his right. That's exactly what the other B hydrogen sees. He sees a hydrogen to one side and a methyl to the other side. So that's why they are equivalent. And lastly here, what are we going to do with this hydrogen right here? Is he equivalent to B? The answer is no, he would actually be a C-type hydrogen. And think about it, he's the only hydrogen in this ring that's connected to a carbon that has another hydrogen. The B-type hydrogens, remember, are connected to a carbon that has a methyl. However, what about the hydrogen here underneath? Is he a C-type hydrogen or is he a D-type hydrogen? Well, think about it. Our C-type hydrogen, when he looks across the table, to one side he sees a methyl, and to the other side he sees a hydrogen. Notice that's exactly what the hydrogen underneath would see as well. A methyl on one side, a hydrogen on the other. That puts him in the same electronic environment, so that means this is a C-type hydrogen. So we should expect to see three signals in the HNMR for this molecule. Notice the NMR is saving the day here. Since this guy has three signals, we can use it to distinguish these three molecules. Now, notice what happened here. Let's look at another sample problem here. What I'm trying to show you through the previous example in this one is that when you have a ring structure and your orgo exam is asking you how many types of hydrogens, you have to convert that ring structure into a table. So in this case, if you have a four-membered ring, you'd have a four-corner table. And you'd have to place the atoms connected to your molecule above and below the table. So for instance, the carbon in the ring that has the methyl attached to it, he also has a hydrogen, so we would represent him like this. The rest of the carbons in this ring have two hydrogens attached to them. We would represent each carbon then like this, showing a hydrogen above and below here, doing the same for this carbon, and doing the same for this carbon right here. And remember, we take note what's above the table and what's below the table. This works for any ring structure. So this would be the first thing you would do on your orgo exam. Then you start identifying your hydrogens. Let's start here with the methyl. Let's call him A. These hydrogens would clearly be different from this hydrogen right here. Let's call him B. And B is definitely not like this hydrogen over here, so let's call him C. However, notice we do have a line of symmetry that runs this way. That means this hydrogen over here would also be a C-type hydrogen. And the hydrogen underneath here, he would have to be a D-type hydrogen. And again, because of our line of symmetry, that would make this a D-type hydrogen. Remember, the C-type hydrogens, when they look across the table, they will see the A-methyl hydrogens. Whereas the D-hydrogens, when they look across the table, they will not see any methyl hydrogens. That brings us to the next hydrogen. This would be the E-type hydrogen right here. Notice he's further away from the methyl hydrogens than the C-hydrogens. And what about this last remaining hydrogen here? Is he an E-type? No, actually, he would be an F-type hydrogen. Again, remember, because the E-type hydrogen, when he looks across the table, he'll see a methyl. The F hydrogen, when he looks across his side of the table, he sees a hydrogen instead. That's enough of a different electronic environment, so we should expect to see six signals in the HNMR for this molecule. So, there it is. Out of the four aspects of NMR, not only learn the first one, but saw examples of it, and that is, remember, the number of peaks in the NMR spectrum, they equal the number and types of hydrogens or other atoms in the molecule. What I try to do through these examples is to expose you to all the possible situations. At this point, you should be able to go to your organic chemistry textbook and do most of the HNMR problems that are similar to this. Remember, we're aiming for mastery of this subject. So I purposely tried to expose you to most, if not all, of the possible situations you might find yourself in when confronted with these types of problems. 
However, you need to practice them on your own. You can't just watch me do them. In fact, before you go on to the next online lecture, you should try to practice some of these on your own first.